Uh, so I had an interesting one recently. Big news. Big news. Ready for this? I'm going out for a hunt. Well, yeah, animals. Yeah, I, I know, animals, like in, in the bush, like regional park thing, hunting. Like rabbits. Not rabbits, big rabbits. With Yeah. Um, so I thought I'd better take the um, browning out of the um, safe and actually shoot it and check the thing was zeroed because I've got no idea what ammo it was zeroed to, whether it was reloads or factory loads or whatever. So I just grabbed a box of psycho ammo because I'm like, well, whatever, I can't be bothered reloading, just going to do that. Um, what, what caliber is it? Uh, 7 mil eight. I'm in Auckland. Yeah, two 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 fifty. No, I'm in Auckland. It's a seven mil eight. I mean, come on. I, th- I thought you were shooting like a six GT or something for your hunting rifle. No, I I had the opportunity to shoot an uh, shoot an animal with my my comp gun recently, and I didn't because I actually got behind the rifle. Everything's lined up. There's like a mob of them. I'm like, nah, this is this is actually just doesn't feel right you know like 50 <laughs> meters with my um six creedmoor and the new pre anyway i was just like nah didn't really matter anyway so i do that so i set it all up and i was i was setting, in the process of setting it up and i thought okay well bush hunting most shots are gonna be 50 or 100 but if i you know get out to 200 i'm at the point i'm kind of comfortable taking a shot at two 300 probably you know if an opportunity presented itself but i've still got my first scope it's my first rifle we've got a scope so it's just got a z3 on there uh three to nine and it's just got plex and not really dialable. That's Swarovski turrets that aren't got numbers on and everything. And I was looking and I'm like, you know what? I no longer am comfortable just having a standard Plex scope on there if I'm going to take a shot at 200 meters because now that notion of just aiming a little bit high and going, she'll be right, suddenly does not appeal to me. And I'm just like, that's not, I know better than that now. So I've pulled it out. I've actually put, I've replaced my Swaro Z3 with an old Weaver, which is old enough that it's a mil MOA mismatch sure. <laughs> uh, second focal plane got the reticle cool. yeah yeah so i figured out all the, the sub tensions and all those you know um but i can dial so we'll see we'll see how that goes it's probably going to bug the crap out of me but so i think sometime a new hunting scope will be on the list but they got me thinking that yeah it's um, i'm not even talking long range not even thinking five six seven or some of the stuff i see which is maybe something else we can talk about but yeah, 200 meter shot. I'm suddenly like, no, nah, I want to be able to dial and get my range finder, get a ballistic proper drop and everything. So um, it's just interesting. Basically, I see guys now taking further and further shots with all kinds of rigs that maybe they shouldn't be with. And I just think, yeah, I'm, I'm less comfortable now more than ever shooting 200 meters on an animal without a proper rig set up and going. Yeah, I went back in time a little bit and... Uh put a three to nine Bushnell trophy scope on my uh, old match 260 that is now my hunting gun. Mm. Um, didn't have anything else floating around. So I just put that on it for the weekend and zeroed it at a hundred mil dot reticle in it. And um, had a look at some of the ammo that I had floating around. I had some 95 V maxes uh, doing 3450. Um, so 1.1 mil of elevation to 375 meters. Mm. And so I only ever had to hold um, yeah one one point five mil I think was a max hold for the whole for the whole week and um, yeah it was awesome <laughs> it was it was quite good fun going going back in time a little bit and just yeah just having holdovers and yeah nice and light at least yeah well this is the thing I haven't even figured it out and more than likely if if we come across a seeker in the heavy bush or anything it's going to be probably at twenty meters so. Uh, yeah. So if you if you hear any news reports, uh, it's me and another guy, and uh, between the two of us, if, if we do get any into any mischief, it, it's going to end up on the news. It's going to be a horrendous combination of people out there if that happens. So anyway, you, I'll, I'll you, the, the, the point of shooting a long way hunting, like I shoot, uh, I try to limit myself to under five hundred when it comes to hunting. Ideally, closer. Um, we went the other day with Jeff and the goats for it. 300 and we end up walking to like 80 meters because it was just simpler right hmm. um but i do stretch it out a little bit with um uh what i think is appropriate guns that i can do it with there's uh, something popped up on one of the long range new zealand uh group um last night <laughs> guy new to it new to long range uh getting old was this thing wanted to sh- shoot game at a thousand meters plus with a three threat lap or a magnum to make up for his um ailing uh, abilities climbing hills i imagine um you still got to get there though yeah how do you recover it <laughs> well how do you how do you find it when it runs away with a hole in it oh of course the issue. of course uh 
again, people would say the same to me with 500 men. Yeah. But uh, I think there's a there's a unfortunate. Um, oh, and he, he didn't want to practice. He didn't want to practice in comps or or hand load or anything. So he just kind of wanted to go out there and blast things. Um, yeah. Just did you so, send him yeah. a link to countdown? <laughs> What's that? I just send him a link to countdown. Yeah. 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 A new world. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's. I think it's an issue with um, again, people think I shoot too far when I hunt. Um, that's fine, but there's a, a thing that new shooters think you can just come out and hunt game. Like I could put together a, a gun for a new shooter, make them a dope chart, and they could probably hit a thousand meters on a 500 mil, millimeter piece of steel and six seven shots with a bit of coaching. Yeah, that doesn't mean you can go out into the field and shoot a goat or a deer or a fucking rabbit, whatever, with the same efficiency. And um, I'm not going to go into the realm of ethics because everyone has different ones. There's no rules, right? Um, but you still want the animal to die. So you've got to be wanting to put it into its vitals or shoulders, have enough energy, have a bullet that expands. All these things come with experience that I don't have. Um, mm. So I'm saying a, a new shooter, uh, I'll, if they want to learn to shoot a bit further, would be, well, first of all, practice. But say I, I want to shoot to 300 meters, which for a lot of hunters is a long way. You know, learn learn uh, learn to do that before you sort of bite off more you can chew and um, shoot a deer in the ass that you're never going to find and the thing takes a week to die or whatever. Um, it's kind of off track from what we're talking about, but it's yeah. My, my biggest thing about hunting, um, at, let's say, of a, you say 500, I'm kind of in the same realm. Um, even at 500 or 400, if you have wind um, mm-hmm. and, and past 500, obviously it just gets way worse. But um, every time I go shoot my, my precision rifle and we're shooting at smaller plates, like I shot at a smaller plate that I had 450 and I, I, I still had to put a little bit of wind on it. Um, and I'm shooting a high BC bullet at higher velocities and all of that. Now you want to take a hunting rifle, which is light. It's got more recoil. Um, it's not as stable. Um, and if you don't practice and you don't understand how to read the wind, um, and even us having a little bit of experience or I having a, having a little bit of experience with wind, I'm still kind of nervous and going, hey, are, are we reading the right wind here and there before taking that shot? Because mm-hmm. you talk about ethical kill, but it's, it's more uh, to me as well. And and making that first round impact, how many times can you go to a, a match and say that on every single stage, I'm at a first round impact? Mm, no one does. Exactly. No one. So that, that's where the... That's where that, and, and this is, as I remind people, yeah. these are people who go out to these competitions and shoot them semi regularly, and are actually, if you want to use the word, qualified to go. Hey, field shooting, long range field shooting. This is what our sport is, and you've got sort of four guys here who are hesitant for it. It's like the guy who yeah. doesn't do that, doesn't shoot as much, and is taking shots twice as long as we probably would. You kind of like mm, well, your your bigger caliber is not going to solve your problem. No, no. You'll find the the more experience you get the less distance you'll shoot. Mm. Yep. And like how many how many times you you talk to a shooter is like, oh yeah, I shot that tar across the valley at seven hundred meters. But well, okay. <laughs> well, oh, what's the range finder are you using? Oh, I didn't use a range finder. I oh, wore it. Or what you what did you use? Oh, I'm a two seventy. Oh how'd you hold over? Oh, I just aimed it at shoulder. Yeah. Just over the top of the shoulder. So yeah, it wasn't seven hundred meters. Yeah, it wasn't 700 meters. It was and it was 350. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. They had they had to walk around 700 meters all the way around. <laughs> yes. I, I, I think one thing, and, and he gets quoted a lot now because they're kind of rock stars in the precision world. But um, the modern day sniper guys, Kalen and um, Phil. But I, I'm going to mess the quote up. But they're saying if you're unsure or something of the hit, if I you know I might hit it, then you probably shouldn't shoot at it. Yeah. yeah. If so you're surprised than, that you hit it. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, that's well. That's your. St- it's Stephen Ronella from Meat Eater. Yeah, is where I first heard. Who doesn't shoot? Who doesn't shoot very far at all for most nope. of his stuff? Um, nope. And it, there, there you've got. Now you don't even have a, a precision shooter, competition shooter, and what the hell do they know? That's the guy who runs the Meat Eater show. Um, yeah. Who amazingly, now they own these guys as well. They own First Light. I didn't realize. Talking of 
growing. And Meteor amazingly, and massive. Anyway, yes. I've just uploaded some cool old episodes from like six years ago in New Zealand that are on YouTube and free if you want to look where, at them. where he sticks a pig. Yeah, That's I didn't watch that one because I don't awesome. like um, I don't like that kind of pig hunting. But I'm so not big on it either, but it's it's enlightening to see Stephen Ronella as he gets up and uh, having put a knife yeah. into it and he nailed it. Yeah. Um, um, anyway, so a, yeah, he, a he tar was and his... a chamois and a red deer. It's cool. Yep. It's eating the ta ta ta. Yeah, but oh, it's just how they um how they film the outdoors and present hunting in that show is uh. It's very cool. It's in a way that people with no interest in hunting, uh, ex- excluding maybe the scenes of dismemberment and, and gutting. But even then, uh, it's done in a certain way, you know. It's, it's the, beautiful. the focus. Yeah, cool. Okay, so you, you've given me another segue into something I was humming and hiring because we've been. So, what you don't get is glorification of the kill shot. Yes, through yep. it. And, and it's the first hunting show I'd ever seen where they I've seen him injure animals and they get away. And yep. you see yep. how much it messes them up and the, yep. the guys. And there's been ones where they don't get anything. Where the, mm. And the, there was one where... For three days a, and there's no... There's so, one where he got attacked by a moose too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Charged yep. him and smashed him. <laughs> yep. Classic. But, I, I would almost I would also, almost make the comparison that, that Peter Eater is for hunting what Top Gear is for cars or was for cars. You, mm-hmm. You'd watch Top Gear and, and like someone else who watched Top Gear with you is not really interested in, in cars and, and find it entertaining as well. Yeah. Um, mm. And I like the way he uses, if you listen to how he talks about hunting, um, I'd never be able to explain myself and, and, and he puts words together and it, and it all makes sense. And the people who not necessarily hunters or might be a little bit like d- d- disagree with the way that you do things. Yeah. If you show them that they look at it and they go, okay, I understand what you guys more or less feel when you go hunting mm. that whole thing. He, he wrote a wrote a book on the we'll call it the eradication or the hunting to near extinction of the buffalo in America, which is a great mm-hmm. great read as well from a conservation and people learning. And he was coming from a trapping and a you know that so he's like I would have been one of those people, one of those young guys out there shooting, shooting, shooting. But now we know better. And then one mm-hmm. of the the best interactions I've ever seen was in a it was a book signing I think he was doing, and it was somebody who was oh, sitting yeah. there as a vegetarian so vegan, whatever it was and just the way he reframed the statement about it you know how so whatever it was and then answered it honestly it's just beautiful he's a great um bastion he's very um, clear very very yeah. clear yeah um but he's a he's a writer hey yeah i think he's originally a writer so yeah. it's probably where several where books he's a yeah then they're all re- then even some of them not really and there's a there's a netflix special or a docker is it under the stars there's something that's up on Netflix semi recently, which is another one talking about. Is that right? Under the stars? Yeah, Under the I, don't, stars. I don't know. Yeah. Under the stars, and that's him talking from uh, hunting, explaining to the non-hunters sort of why. And what what I give him credit for is he's got a vegan journalist on there, and they use him as a counterpoint, and doesn't really uh, then go back down that. and nail him. It's just as a as a balance counter. It's really quite interesting. Well. Um... Yeah, isn't it his, uh, his his cameraman a vegan? He was I don't know. I, th- yeah. I think he's. I think his cameraman. Well, this might be something different as well because um, I remember an episode that I watched where he was sitting with his cameraman um, uh, on one of the boats in Alaska, and they said they remember um, <coughs> the the first film that they did was one of the like hardest ones. Like um, the weather was was very cold and very hot and so on. And um, the cameraman was kind of, um, he was just interested in what um, Stephen is actually doing. And then he, yeah. he kind of fell in love with nature and started understanding I think, I how they do it. I forget the guy's it. name, but yeah, it's the it's guy something like that. I might be off yeah. a little bit. But. I don't know if he was quite vegan, but he, was, he certainly wasn't a hunter. Yeah. Um, and this is the guy who's now kind of, he's the guy who set the look for a lot of the meat eater. So Stephen, Stephen Ella will often credit him for setting the original look yep. of the meat eater shows, which has been refined. Yep. And um, yeah, I think it was the same thing. He wasn't really into hunting, but at the end of it, he was just totally into it because of just the way it was presented and with those guys. Left-handed it's, as well, incidentally, it, left-handed shooter. There we go. There's yeah. a, uh, a YouTube channel, it's pretty big, it's called like Field Sports Britain. It's odd, the, the English shoot in their own particular way. Um, a lot of shoot, they're just English. Um, but they, <coughs> they've got the Chinese, um, what are they called? Chinese water buck, the little tiny deer, they're like a, a yeah, dog. Yeah. 
and they got fangs instead of antlers. I actually, for years, I thought they were a joke, like the um, yeah, the taxidermy fangs. joke thing. Yeah, and I never wanted to ask because I'd be too embarrassed that I didn't know those things. But they are, they're real. Come, come again. They've got fangs. Yeah, they've got antlers. they've got fangs instead of antlers. They're a Chinese water buck. Google them. <laughs> okay, very very cool. Now there's, there's, heaps watch, them, there's heaps of them over there now and there. Yeah, so this is this is where I'm going with this. Um, so they were introduced, and they I, I don't know how they classify things here. Like here, we have pest species, right? But this, they had a Sheila on there who, a lady, I should say. <laughs> um, uh, Dirk, um, do we need to explain what a Sheila is? Is it a no, kidney? Yeah. Um, okay, cool. uh, I've been here long enough. Uh, okay, like sweet, cool. Just, just like I had a group of people, I said, I don't want to teach you how to suck eggs. And then I stopped and went, <laughs> do you all know what I mean? And everyone's like, <laughs> yeah. no, like, okay, it's cool. Um, so yeah. she's a, uh, she's, she's vegan by choice, which is fine. Um, but she's incredibly well. She draws animals, but she, um, yeah. as in wild animals, uh, but she's incredibly interested in conservation. And the the, the numbers of these Chinese water buck uh, too high, and they're doing damage, and etc. So, um, like if we don't manage a herd here, um, it can get out of control. So she went hunting with them. Uh, they selected a water buck that was past his prime uh, and um, from the, the small amount I know when they get to a certain age when they're not really breeding anymore they get aggressive yep. so they start attacking younger animals and, and such so they found one his tusks were um, damaged which Thanks. indicated he'd been uh, fighting a lot and she shot it she shot the deer and helped harvest it and I believe she even ate it or ate some of it um, being that the idea that the animal wasn't factory farmed yep. or uh, so on and so forth. Um, and it was quite a, uh, I mean, it's a show. It could all be made up, who knows? But it was interesting anyway, the uh, the conservation side taking over the, the the ethical side of not wanting to eat animals at all. Um, but I don't know, it was, it was, it was worth watching. You, you find it yeah. easy enough on YouTube. Yep. Um, just an interesting look at thing, but these deer are funny. You, you watch them, they're filming them, and they look like a fellow deer kind of size. Maybe not quite that big, or, or a roe deer. I think fans. they're even smaller yeah. than a fellow. They're tiny. They're, they're like a half size yeah. of a, a, like a yearling fellow. They're half the size. Yeah. Like so they'll shoot it. Size maybe. Like a small goat. Yeah. Even smaller. They carry it on a shoulder like a handbag when they shoot them. But they'll <laughs> shoot it and they'll go up, and you, you're expecting this thing that's say a meter tall or seven hundred fifty tall. It's not. It's like so this book, it's like a, it's an odd deer. Um, it, you just need to see them in scale. Um, again, interesting to look at. But it, it, that that whole uh, being vegan, and, and a lot of people are vegan for environmental reasons or um, uh, factory I'm farming and, and all of that. Yeah. So for those reasons, they they think I'm not going to do it. But um, it was interesting to see the side that no, we need to do conservation to protect. Uh, yeah native species um so it's okay well and also like i've had some of the the i guess the better conversations i've had about hunting have been with vegetarians or vegans if you can establish why it is that they are vegan vegetarian because if it is they're not mm -hmm. into the factory hunting or they're wanting to understand traceability and stuff like that then yeah you can actually engage and have a conversation i'm not not going to turn around and go but you should hunt but it's like well yeah, yeah. that's that's just a it's a, a different take if you've just got militant either side pro or anti hunting whatever it is then it's never a very good conversation but i found a lot of them are actually open to it you know yeah I've, yeah i've yeah, got a, a good, uh, yeah. so I've, I've got a very good friend um is it called a hunter terrian yeah well he oh, basically right. only a hunter terrian he oh, only eats yeah. the meats that he hunts so any fish it's, a worthy, it's probably a worthy goal is what that is but yeah, yeah. so he only he hunts a lot and but obviously with fishing and so on he dives and he fishes and he he's quite yep. an outdoorsy guy so he would um not eat he would never buy like meat at a um at a store um so that's that's kind of his his approach which is i i think that's almost the most na natural approach if you can do it but it's it's kind of 
tough to sustain, if I can say. Uh, well, it's like how humans have lived for thousands of years, in a way. It's no different yep. from yep. what so, we did 100 years ago. Where there well, was no was, it was a comment I read recently, vegetarianism, veganism, is a, it's a pretty first world luxury that we wouldn't have had for a longer longest of times. And there's someone yeah, I'm lining. Funnily enough, it's unrelated. We're getting, really getting away from Maybe I should go back on the bloke. We're away from Precision Shooter now. But um, there's a guy I'm lining up for an interview, actually for on the bloke side, rather, the trigonometry show, um, who's a doctor doctor who's involved with the carnivore eating um uh movement i suppose and i'm um, going to talk to him about the, the i don't know if you guys ever read a book called the hunting hypothesis no it's mm-hmm. a bit of, it's a bit a bit on the edge of the, the fringe edge of, edge of things but talking about yeah the way that we eat now is as a result of yeah we were hunter gatherers for a long time it's where we got where we are it's only now that we're there that we can then go oh now i don't need to do eat that way anymore so um, um we're, we're we're going we're going around and, and it's actually quite a good conversation and i'm definitely not here to, to bag people's lifestyle choices not at all uh i, I like the idea <laughs> of what you want you're doing stuff i really no, feel uh, you're uh, framing it up for something though Greg. no i'm not i'm not I, okay, I, right. I just think it's an interesting conversation but, but, but if, if you're if, 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 no, if no, no but yeah no if, if everyone uh can live their life the way they want uh, yeah, it's just the, that's the way I see the world as, as being a better place, as long as it's not hurting other people, of course. Um, but I nearly said the butt word, but but it's an interesting <laughs> comparison that people with um, who who are vegetarian and, and vegan or, or whatever for these reasons actually have a huge amount in common with a lot of hunters who yes. like to feed <clears throat> feed their family uh, more natural meats. Uh, it's more cost effective sometimes, uh, depending where you go um and how many and also like there. to do yeah 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 yeah, yeah. not if you live in all time I don't, I don't, <laughs> just, I don't care any. but but you know like say if you want to um forage or or hunt game be it rabbits through to deer to pigs uh on on private property on farms for, for landowners or in, in the bush um a certain aspect of the um ideals align i believe and uh yep. It's interesting. I, I imagine it's been looked into plenty of times, but um, I'm lucky enough to not pay for a lot of meat. I buy chicken. Uh, we make an effort for it to be free range. Uh, my wife likes it that way. Um, we raise our own beef here. Um, I shoot some wild pigs. I raise my own sheep, uh, venison, and, and so on. I, but, I'm, but I'm a beef guy. Our own eggs, we eat from our own garden as much as we can seasonally. Um, but some maybe let's say 50 percent of our stuff is um from where we live um uh part of it's to save money and just like i don't know what beef costs i've never ever paid for it but um i don't know is it cheap i don't know no well no it's not i'm lining and funnily enough i'm lining up an interview as well for butcher probably week after next so i'll get you the the, the prices exactly for it um, <laughs> well like cause see the thing is but but you know what i mean like if, if oh it's i know i know this we, world of 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 uh instant gratification i'm the same i buy order something i want it next couple days um we're the same with food we don't want to put the effort in uh and and again this isn't me putting huge effort in it's like my my lovely wife growing veggies and trying to grow fruit trees and uh looking after the chickens and so on and so forth and i mean we're buying in food for the chickens which is an actual it's an animal waste product now i think of it's made out of cows but um she's growing the veggies she's turning the the ground uh i hunt quite a lot or at least pest control uh, and now i don't eat everything I, I make no uh make no sort of um stories up that i take everything home when it's doing pest control but if more people did it i think it would be better um it's even the most natural people, way of living well just for well you living i mean you can come in south africa hunting is extremely popular outside of yep I imagine a lot of it but, but yep. people knowing where your meat comes from, um, mm. kids knowing that uh, meat comes from an animal or, or, yep. or seeing a carcass hanging on the hook. Um, like to this day, I don't like gutting animals. I'll do it, but I don't I don't like it. And if, if someone else wants to do it, I'll certainly let them. Um, but you, knowing that, you know, that fillet steak comes from above the backbone yep. or that rump steak sits the ass or the ham or... Um, Man, we're off topic, but it's just—I don't know—it's interesting, anyway. It's um, you say that like you're surprised. Yeah, that's right. it's, I'm, <laughs> no, no, it's no. Right. I'm listening and I'm keeping a framing over here. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, it's it's just the, the whole meat eater thing. I guess it yeah. sort of 
um, draws back to that. But having responsibility for not say all of your food, but where, where some of your food comes from, I don't think it's a bad thing. Mm. No, no, especially not at this point where, you know, if I didn't make an intentional effort to educate my kids that, yeah, it's meat doesn't come pre-packed in a styrofoam package and everything that came from a sandwich. It's like when, you know, when the girls say meat, it's like, no, I will always explain what kind of animal it came from. And they've obviously eaten venison. Uh, Claudia's been out up in Balnagown, so it's seen us hunt and gut out an animal, you know? So yeah. it's not so. It's not something with, and I speak from a metro urban because that's where, you know, Auckland, right? Mm. Um, there's so many people that have, have no, no connection to the land or to actually animals or the sources of their food, um, yeah. you know. I was um, up on the uh, in-laws' farm at Christmas time. I took my took my youngest, she's seven, out for a out for a shoot, and um, we shot a magpie with the twenty-two, and she um, she wanted to take it back to the house and eat it. And yeah. <laughs> she was she was all about it. <laughs> but it's a funny thing. Although Where are you? I said, yeah. I said well, how about we just pick it up? She and, and she wanted to take a photo with it, and so she could show everyone so i said oh how about we just pick it up and we'll just take it over and throw it over the fence so, okay here's, we'll here's a question but i'm not i'm not having it but so why not eat it is it is it a concern of the the amount of prep that's probably gonna have to do actually to get a mouthful of food out which you know <laughs> same as i think duck hunting sometimes to get a duck breast out is that you need a lot of them um maybe, but, maybe. Uh, what you've reminded me of is like my, my old man who grew up on farms and stuff, when we were doing pest control and shooting rabbits, he wouldn't ever eat the rabbits because he still had this feeling that they were a dirty animal. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the rabbits are going around like carrying myxomatote, whatever the farmers around the country and they're yelling at me because of whatever. But, you know, they're not, they just eat grass, walk around. So they're probably not quite bad. And then I said, the irony is though, is if you go into a higher end fancy as restaurant in the middle of town, you can order rabbit and it will cost you the, the thing, or you can go out and shoot it and just prep it. So here, here is dearer than venison by a long ways usually. Yeah. And I eat a lot of here. I like, love it. I'd, I'd eat here over venison any day. Let's see. I think, I think you've got to introduce magpie to the market. It could be your thing. Maybe. Could be a I've got a, I got a chef. I got a chef mate who still wants. We're gonna line it up. He still wants to cook up and do some pooks as well. Um, and I mean, it, if if you call it magpie, people might just think it's some kind of pie. Magpie pie. Magpie pie. Magpie pie. Just call it magpie. magpie. Um. So here, birds, oh, birds yeah. are a funny thing though. Just quickly, like uh, like you say, uh, we've got peacocks. Like. Pluck and gut a peacock is a lot of work. It's easier to gut and skin a deer than it is, yeah. in my opinion, because I'm not very good at it. Yeah. Um, it's less work on a deer than it's a peacock. So, yeah, magpies is um, shit. <laughs> oh, I guess you, I... could breast, you could breast them out would probably be the... Uh... Yeah. They're, they're bastards. Everyone needs to shoot all the magpies. Mm. Yes, not yes, disagreeing yes. there. Not disagreeing yeah. there. Sorry, heads. You said heads or something. What? You, you were moving on, I interrupted. No, I'm not really moving around. I'm trying to reframe around. So, uh, yeah, I've put a dialable scope on my hunting rifle. <laughs> Is that how we got here? Probably. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that was the, that I mentioned there hunting. There was a guy so with a that wanted to shoot deer at a camp. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. So I put a dialable scope on my rifle. And um, a couple of days after doing that, in quick succession, I've seen two headshot deer at um, long range and mm. everyone circle jerking about what a fantastic shot it was. One was a kilometer, one was about four or 500 meters. You lads yeah, may have seen the video. Yeah, and from Australia. Yeah, so. Which, and they were surprised that they hit it. And they were surprised they hit it. It was a second round hit because they hadn't accounted for wind on the first one. Oh, I the other one, I know. The so the, o the other one that I saw as well was a guy had actually, as as people will do, they he commented, "Hey, you know, uh, this is 500 meters head shot on a deer." It's like, do you really think that's the best shot to be taking? And the guy turned around and said, "Oh, I wouldn't normally do it. In fact, I wasn't aiming for the head. I was aiming for the shoulder." Yep. Goodness. So now he's actually missed that shot by about half a meter, but he's nailed it in the head. So everyone goes, "Great shot." Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just, I have to wonder because I've got a question. We've got a question in the comments here from Neil about um, uh, knowing your limits and comfortable range in terms of ethical hunting. And we had this oh, conversation yeah, a while, we had a question a while 
back, um, which David, who still hasn't been, David's going to come on here and talk about ethical hunting. Uh, he put forward as well about limits and what the ethics of long range hunting and stuff were. And it's something I do think about. I, I maybe put forward that um, ethical or, you know, how do you know you're good enough? And I was thinking about it, I'm like, well, maybe good enough is I can hit a six inch target, which is going to be your kill zone, not 12 inches, but a six inch target, 95% of the time at whatever distance is that you think you're going to take a shot at. Now, I can't hit a six inch target 95% of the time at a kilometer. No. 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 With whatever you give me. I, ha I have done repeatedly. I can hit him. Couldn't, couldn't guarantee. First round. First yeah. round hit. That's the other important bit, I think, there as well. Um, and then then that plate shouldn't be at the same place every single time because <laughs> after a month, you know where the oh, wind yeah. normally comes through. You, Over you an know, environment so you've never shot before. Every yeah. single time and with your hunting rifle. And, well, I, I, yeah. I, listened, I re listened recently to one of my older interviews with Todd Hodnett. And he was talking about long range hunting. We talked about that. And um, he was talking about his his son had taken, had hit a hog, I think, at two kilometers. That was the... Seven was, kilometer, 300 Norma Magnum or whatever it was. Yeah, so, okay, so two, two kilometers. Pig, first round hit. So this is the squad, right? So it's Todd Hodnett's son. Todd Hodnett is spotting over his shoulder. And anyone want to guess who is calling wind for the guy? David Tubb. Close. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Litz. So he's got Brian Litz over his shoulder calling win. Todd Hodnett spotting and calling. And it's the son of Todd Hodnett taking a shot. And this is not something they do regularly. This is something that was the, you know, pinnacle of shooting. So yeah. when guys go, well, look, I, I'm taking shots of this. I'm like, well, what's your shooting squad looks like? Because that was a pretty tight squad, you know? So, yeah. um, I mean, David Tubb, maybe David Tubb was doing the reloading for him. That would round it up nicely, I suppose. Supplying the bullets. Yeah. I've, <laughs> I've got a video up on my, um, it, it'll be on my Facebook, but on YouTube as well. Um, goat culling and 500. So what I believe was my comfortable limit on the day. Like it's bang on 500 and I shot and I blew the thing's head off. It's on video. And yeah. in the video it says, bang, shot or something like that. And what it turned out to be was my scope was actually shifting. So I actually had to send the old scope away, get it replaced. But um, if the same thing, people are going, awesome, wicked shot, you're the man. And I'm like, no, no, that's I didn't mean to hit it in the head. Yep. I was going for the shoulder. Um, yes, it's dead, but I, I just as likely could have taken its jaw off. Um, coming to learn later that, because I did a shot at like 280, and I had a similar issue, hit it in the neck. And I'm thinking, that's weird. Uh, and, and it was the scope was um, not doing what it should be, but yeah. it's a good point you make about that. Like you could you could take the shot and go, yeah, I'm I'm awesome. Look how good I am. But in reality, who are you kidding? Um, it's, 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 yeah. There's there's yeah. I guess the thing is you see my concern is is that you have uh, apart the the animal was hit it dropped dead because it had just mm -hmm. been shot in the head it was one yeah. it was flop bang flop dead okay so yep. that's okay we didn't have an injured animal we didn't have anything like that because no one in their right mind i don't think would have put the shot up if it shot it in the jaw and it went running off it's not something you put up on facebook right bet mm -hmm. it happens but people are not gonna put that on facebook so anyway at least it's dropped but i guess my concern is is people getting into this either beginners or intermediate uh, then going really what are you shooting with what's your cartridge selection and they're trying to do the shopping list so that they can go out and do the same thing because without that context around it and may i don't know maybe the guy does hit you know 99 out of 100 times at a kilometer at those shots in, in which case cool that's sweet but not many people i'd say in the world are actually to that except social media then creates this illusion that oh that's now a new standard we should all be trying to beat that it, it, it's, it's almost like um before someone puts puts up a video like that they have to put down some kind of this is my credentials i've been shooting for 15 years or i've only been shooting for two months and this is a luck shot mm, yeah. um before they they create that idea especially for like new shooters because they open up youtube and they type in long range hunting yeah. And they've got millions of options and people shooting with a two to three at 700 meters with a headshot and 20 K an hour wins. Um, 
standing. Which into it. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, standing. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's uh, it's tough to regulate. Um, uh, I don't think you you can't regulate it. Oh, the only no, thing you, I you guess, can't. which which what what was getting me thinking about this actually is is the tie-in as well as we're gonna now we're gonna go segue sideways is the conservation and and guys like Steve or you can see now even locally where there is a big push through. So the deer stalkers really push this con- conservation, hunters for conservation, all these things. Um, I think we also just need to all be careful as a community of these videos going up. Because we just need to be very careful, I think, of being portrayed and taking these long, long range shots. As uh, I used to say to people, it's like um, it's like the the compilations of kill shots, right? And I don't know, and I'm sure people are gonna, I'll get probably hate messages for this, but I still find it kind of weird that people get their jollies looking at a compilation of animals getting killed. I just find that weird. All right, and I know I get it, and I'll still look at a guy will go, "Oh, look at this thing," and they blind the scent. But it, there's a difference between putting that out on Facebook, where everyone randomly, without any context, can look at it, and it's the best of 2020 kill shots of some big epic music and everything, and those photos that you used to have on the phone or in the flipbook or stuff that your close mate who you know each other would go, "Dude, look at this one," and you'd be like, "Jesus," because he's you know, but now it's just like we'll just put it up on social media on a group where anybody can see it you know with with no context and with no understanding um and yeah i think that's that's we're at a we're at a night we're at a a good place at the moment because the guys are changing their messaging you know which i think is important and needed into that conservation and and guardianship whatever you want to call it of of the 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 earth um but yeah we just need to be careful as well because we're not glorifying one certain yeah, aspect of it you know but guys can put out um first round hits at, at on steel at a kilometer all day long do where's compilation videos of that stuff the best of have, the have, shoot have, you know have, have, do you guys follow that uh what's it g7 precision g7 precision something rings a bell uh, um on instagram that on their stories they've got um this thing going where they would shoot a target um and you can see the bullet that the trace perfectly and then they kind of ask you to comment, um, what do you think the distance is? But I, for some reason, I cannot stop watching those videos because the trace is just it's so, and it's so well done. You can 100% see how it just curls in and uh, people start commenting there and they give like their little calculations. It's quite interesting. Some of the guys are pretty good at it. So more, so more trace videos, lads. We want trace videos. We want. Um, I would love them. Nailing target shots. It's all cool, and I'll happily. It's like your vid- you like your long range twenty two videos, Graham. It's just like yeah, it's cool. Yeah, but there's, mm. you know, if you just if there was some dude taking pot shots at an animal or something in the same way, you'd be like, well, hang on a minute, that's not really yeah. what we need. Um, where I um, where I shoot a lot of twenty twos, one of the ranges is uh, situated uh, west east. And there's a row of trees and as the sun shines through the trees the light will strobe and so you'll actually see the projectile all the way Ooh. through to the target from behind and um you get get the light right and you can watch the projectile all the way in not trace the actual projectile all the way through That's yeah cool. I've, I've had that with the 22 as well you can see how it punches the hole you can see from the barrel from the muzzle just go right through because i think the sun came up behind us and yeah. it was kind of reflecting on the back of the of the bullet hey, so you touched on kerry you touched on the comment from neil from nortrack precision yes um but at the end of it it says as well as the importance of safe glassing and spotting with binoculars and spotting scopes yep so it's just interesting like we're talking about so I, limits on yeah so things. i guess i i read that and part of because if people don't realize, you guys know this, but if people listening and don't realize, I do I do the practical component of firearms licensing for the police, right? Mm-hmm. When people are applying for the license. And it's something I try and explain to people as well as in, um, you know, identify your target beyond all doubt. Please don't try and identify those targets through your rifle scope. Yeah. And the reason mm-hmm. I'm explaining that to people is that we're trying to decouple that, that decision to actually take a shot or shoot at something in the identifying process so if you're on the rifle and that's where you're identifying where you're everything's getting very close 
before you've fully identified a, a target. So I suggest to people myself that they take even, which I'll do on the weekend is in the bush with an eight times pair of binos or something. And that's how I'm identifying my target, then switching over to the gun once I've actually done it. Um, so I'm thinking that's that's what he's meaning, Graham. Is that how you've taken yeah. it as well? Or the, yeah. Yeah, I, see, I've um, only recently gone to using binoculars a lot when um, doing pest control or hunting. Um, mainly just that I wanted a good pair and I'd always um, blow my sort of monthly budget on other things. Um, so of all things, my mum bought me... Short action house. <laughs> yeah. Um, who do, you know, you need 20 guns yeah, yeah. Per, each year. Um, but you mean? Ha having the... <laughs> No, they, they sell sows and mouses as well. Um, <laughs> but having the binoculars, also it's made spotting a lot easier. So what I was doing is using my rangefinder. Uh, it's a Leica, nice clear glass, but not a particularly big image. So, uh, And then a friend also got some binoculars, but the, the difference it has made just for, first of all, ease of spotting. Um, <clears throat> so obviously you're going to identify your target better, but... Again, my hunting is not really thick bush. I don't often venture sure. um, in yep. the bush. It's more open stuff. Um, but they even cross over. So having... Uh, now, these are Steiners. They're not really cheap binoculars. Um, having them has also worked. So a lot of time I'll go shooting precision and I'll mix in some hunting pest control just because of where I am. But I'm pushing these into a spotting role in competition now rather than uh, lugging mm -hmm. around a spotting scope. It's just one more big thing you got to carry around the hills um so and they're so slow to get on target a spotting scope whereas the binoculars you just point in a direction there you go i'm on target um obviously this is no why you obviously need to mount a red dot on the side of your spotting scope can i mount a red dot on my binoculars yes yes you can yeah, that's some south <laughs> island can do attitude right there no but it's, it's an interesting point and 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 from what i understand I have, i've not met neil but i've talked to some people who know him and he, he knows his stuff apparently when it comes to tracking and all sorts of really really cool stuff um, and hunting so um yeah spotting uh, this is an interesting point too because i had you mentioned it earlier blair the, the whole schmozzle around the uh target on the skyline which wasn't on skyline it was just a photo but anyway i think one of the comments we was <laughs> one of the comments was um so there's a hill behind it and then there's more hill and then bush private bush uh, so it was the ultimate backstop if everything failed right like the worst comes to worst backstop. Uh, the guy I got offended by this. Um, but in day to day New Zealand bush hunting, you do not know your backstop. You mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. So, an untrained hunter who's just got his license will go in the bush, not be familiar with the area, shoot an animal, hopefully that they know it's an animal. But what's behind it? Trees, yep. ferns, super Another drag. hunter. Yep. Another hunter. Or so, another deer or a, 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 a dock hut, but you can't yeah. see it, right? So normal New Zealand hunting breaches the firearms act instantly a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah, knowing well, what you, the, you the, say about yes, it. Yes, it, it's uh, interesting because it's something I say is, yeah, it's, it's you know, be aware of what you're shooting and what lies behind it. It, it doesn't actually say you can't, right? So. Yeah. There's a fine line, right? And don't anyone but, dare but it will be in. used. It will be used to prosecute you in court. But how? Like, best, best like you said, for, yeah, exactly. So 50 yeah. meters. So what I rephrase that is, is, right, you're in the heavy bush and everything. You're right. You can't see. I say you're responsible for the projectile from the time it leaves your barrel to the time it comes to its final resting point. Mm -hmm. The problem is in heavy bush, you won't be able to see that. But what you do need to do is, one, we're back to this thing of don't be spotting stuff through your scope because you're already that step too far. And even if you are please for the love of god develop some situational awareness at least come out of that scope for a moment and look around and see what else is going on yeah and yeah bonus points if you know that you're heading back to the hut for example and you are walking in the direction of the hut no that's not really a shot you can take you need to get up off into the side or have that and i think that's a big thing i push to people is for a hunting point of view is a situational awareness it just needs to expand beyond you and that potential target that you've got of and where's your hunting mate that's that's the other one yeah. i always say it's yes. just like look around where's your where's your hunting partner so one Some thing way. that made me think of this was i was hunting recently in the pudiora forest now this is flat compared to what i'm used to right so it's heavy old forest but it's relatively flat so the streams now in taranaki you have gullies and ridges and you have creeks at the bottom they all, all work like that it's it's 
there's no if it's flat it was turned into a farm this is the opposite mm. so the creeks don't run in a straight line they just sort of they're weird things i kept getting turned around in the bush i wasn't used to it i i, I couldn't walk in a straight line essentially um but it made me think because you start to lose sight of your mates and you have to really keep uh keep an eye on each other but then like i thought if i do shoot at a deer how am i going to know if i have got turned around where my friends are first of all yep and what's going to stop my bullet because it's so flat whereas in taranaki i'm like like it's, it's a big bloody there's going to be shoot. stuff going up and down kind yeah. of not, yeah not, you not, know not that there's yeah yeah but here it's not and so i'm like if you could you could get really unlucky and that bullet could go for 400 meters just yep. going between things um uh, it's just something I've never really heard talked about, um, and it's just something that's um, I've been thinking about a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm not saying it's, it's I'm it's not a risk. people off. I no, no, I, I think that's it. It's more just getting people to. I and I've got a health and safety background, right? So I talk about yeah. risk management, risk evaluation. You need to be evaluating what is my level of risk I've got presented here. What can I do to mitigate that risk? What can I reduce? Whatever it is, rather than just going, oh, bang, there's something. Oh, oh, yeah. What did I really just shoot at? So, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm slowly working on, what have we done? I've done, I'm actually, funnily enough, I'm working on that article right now for Rod and Rifle, which is yeah. uh, number, Jesus, five, I think it is. You know, mm. and that that's talking about, yeah, what is beyond, you know, what might be. The, the obvious one and the easy one is the ridge line because we're all kind of like, all right, it's a ridge line. It's, it's silhouetted. We can't shoot at that. But mm. you're right, bush, all sorts of other situations. We, uh, another another one's possums. We shoot at possums and trees. Yep. We, since a young age, we've been encouraged to destroy possums um, for obvious environmental reasons, um, conservation reasons. But you yep. shoot into the air. Um, yep. But again, it's oh, I, it's like one of those grey areas where it's like, well, it's probably not the safest because at night time too, you might not know exactly where you are if you're mm. on a new property. But we need these pests destroyed. <laughs> Did you, slightly tangent, did you hear the one about the guy in Hamilton, I think it was, who was shooting a twenty two in his backyard and it left his backyard, went into the neighbor's place, went through the, which is, this is a bit weird, but we'll just give it, went through the drywall, through the jib, through the wall of the house and everything, ricocheted around and hit a 70 year old man in the shoulder. No. Is that, I know, the weird, most, I know, I got gun. that face, I got that face blear with the twenty two and the penetration yeah. levels and ricochet, but whatever, the, whatever. Wow. But yeah, in a semi semi urban, I've got to say, um, environment. So we're we're back to at least, guys. If you're setting these target ranges up, assume that you're not always going to hit exactly where you think it is. And what is behind you? Is it a house? Then no, no, you can't do that. I'm just surprised to hear there was a shooting in Hamilton that wasn't wasn't gang was legal yeah. legal ish. Yeah. <laughs> Normally it's you know, like nah. You know. I, know. Um, no, I, get a, I get a feed with all these things, and I, I filter out the gang stuff because I'm like, all right. But yeah, this was an interesting one because it would have it was you know I was thinking of the guys setting up the ranges and you know ad hoc ranges and so like, yeah I I've, I don't know I don't know all the details but from what I could read that seemed to be you know uh, we, highly penetrating twenty two. We we do a lot of high volume shooting down here like wallabies and hares <laughs> and rabbits and everything. And uh, a lot of spotlighting, and we um, we do an annual wallaby comp. I haven't haven't been able to do it last year, but um, shoot the wallaby, and you go out and collect the heads to put in for the for the competition. And so you got three to five guys in a ute driving around at anywhere from I mean, ten o'clock to three or four o'clock in the morning, and you're getting on and off the trucks get collecting while uh, while people are shooting off the other side of the truck mm. and there'll be discussions as to what we're what are, what's allowed and what's not allowed and some guys will say oh no no it's all right as long as you sh if i'm going out to collect you're only shooting off to this angle and 99 mm. percent of the time if someone's not in the truck that's it nobody's shooting yeah. when you're uh, there that's it you 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 don't shoot if you don't well, know. I, I, i'm reminded of the i'm reminded of the guy who went out to recover the deer he'd shot while spotlighting and got a zip over the back got of the 270 got, got shot by his mate yeah yeah, yeah. which 
I'm sure there's I'm sure there was complicating factors in that yeah. one. But yeah. um but same thing, man. I I, I these days I'm kinda of like if I can't see my hunting partners or whatever it is, I, I don't I personally don't like the idea of two guys and we go off different ways and hunt. I'm, it just makes me nervous. And if we, there has been incidences, that's where it's happened, right? Whereas at least if there's two people with you, you can turn around and reference, well, where is that guy? I, yeah, has he got past me? Especially in heavy bush. This is as I point out to people. If everyone's wearing camo from head to toe, because we all love to wear camo from head to toe in the heavy bush, well, 15 metres away, they disappear. It does a job, you know? So... We, we also regularly do drives, so you'll you'll line up five to ten people in a row, and then walk down through all the Madagari and scrub. Oh, yep. And um, and if you can't see the person beside you, you're on the radio trying to figure out where that person is, and nobody moves until someone can see him or know exactly where they are. And yeah, I um the one pretty- thing. The one thing I do frame these conversations with is the statistics and the numbers of incidences are at an all-time low, right? So we're doing good. They're lower than they ever yeah. have been in regards to hunter misidentification, accidental discharge, negligent discharge, shooting, whatever it is. They're, they're all-time low. So the – and people go, oh, but why are you so paranoid or whatever you want to call about us? Well, we're at an all-time low <clears throat> and we now hold these standards. There might be a correlation between the two. So it's not like – be shit scared of going out hunting because it's a slaughter fest out there but holding us all to accountable to these standards seems to have got us to this position which is a really good position to be in yeah it's not paranoid if it's true yeah and 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 there's a healthy paranoia or there's a healthy level of risk management that's going on yeah anyway uh, we, we have so, an yeah. industry that's um rather dangerous here in Taranaki in the oil industry but we have uh, sort of we we phase in and out of uh, subjects that are sort of the um, the hot HSC things, and like you say, you you have a series of hand injuries, so we'll they'll go real hard on that, mm. and then they get the numbers back, and then we'll move on to something else, and over time these old issues will creep back in again and again yep. and again. Um, so as you were saying, Kerry, we're doing really well by not shooting each other. Or, or, or putting people in danger with our with our legal firearms use, like you say, you don't want to let up the throttle on that and yeah. and slip back and have five people shot a year and you know oh that's not that bad because it's two hundred fifty thousand of us. It's still five guys not going home to see their mum or their, their wife. Um, yeah, so drum at home. You definitely do the best job at this um, the the HEC safety side of it. And people get and, and people do they go oh safety shit, but man, if you fuck it up. That's not, you don't grow yeah. a new heat, you know. Um, no. Yeah. And what I, what I want to say as well, Graham, and, and um, I think uh, that kind of ties into that, the incident in Hamilton is people mistake the, the damage a 22 can do. Yeah. That's True. one of the things that I've seen time and time again. Yep. Is, um, it's just a 22, man. It's got no recoil, what it can do, but that 22 has got, um, it can kill a person very easily. Uh, and and has i think this is the thing so i'm trying to i'm trying to figure out the framework because as i've done the the presentation sort of licensing the presentation has changed and at the moment without um what i'm trying to convey to people at the moment is the responsibility of firearms ownership i think it's a good message of like you you get a firearms license you've taken on a level of responsibility to be a fit and proper good person and treat it with the seriousness that it should have so that you can no longer be the angry person you can no longer be the person who gets in road rage incidences you can no longer you've got to be a higher standard than the rest of the populace because we've accepted the the responsibility of owning firearms so Mm. yeah and i mean if you're into um uh, I mean, this sort of become a hunting and uh, <laughs> centric sort of thing. But if if you do are doing a lot of sports shooting and, and these sort of things, you, you then become also a by default default a def, a sort of a ambassador to the the game, the sport. Um, I, I mean, we're not at the Olympics. We just these these things are still ragtag organised by different sort of factions around the country. But you want to promote it well. You want to be safe and yeah, not you don't want to get us on the news um because we we fuck it up you know like it's um, yeah sorry it just takes one it just takes one person to screw it up and on yeah. that um they well, you, you go to a match and you go and they say oh this person here this is graham he's your 
RO for the day, you listen to him and what he sees goes. It's like, no, everybody that is there with firearms license is an RO. And if you see something stupid and don't say something about it, you're responsible. Mm, yeah. And if something yeah. goes wrong and everybody on in that squad will be held accountable because yeah. you're all above responsible and you, you can't you can't say, oh, well, that guy there, he's the RO, he's responsible. No, that's, that's not and, how it works. And I would suggest because people get uncomfortable with that as a notion, right? A lot of people don't want to spit. So at the beginning of a, of the, the comp or anything, get your squad together and go, hey, are we all cool if we keep each other accountable because there may be a moment? Have we all shot? Are we all comfortable moving with guns and everything? Are we all good if we're we're okay if someone just has to quickly, you know, remind somebody? Because it, it happens to the best of us, you know? It's been interesting going back through some of the videos for Tarada. Not that there's major issues, but with Simon's rule of the bolt closed only when you're basically up on target, I've seen quite a few videos of myself where I'm not – doing that and it's it's just habit and you then look at it and you take a step back and i see what simon's trying to achieve and you're like yeah i get it so we need to just be more aware of that you know uh, simon's last video he put up of him demonstrating yep. a stage he done it twice yep he talked yep. about yep. it like it's yeah that the idea with it again it's uh we're, we're doing the same thing as we we run parallel with the rules um we're not all going to be perfect straight away i'm not i'm no. trying i'm trying to practice it with all my shooting now um but you still bugger it up you know oh, um, and so i mentioned because uh, i spotted um uh kalen right over stateside and i watched the stage where he gets behind there flicks his safety off does a stage mm. flicks the safety on when he's fan i message him like all right what's the deal with safety usage in the comps he's like well i always use it so i'm now trying to drill myself to actually be using the safe the mechanical safety in those situations so at the moment what i'm doing a lot is pulling or, or pressing the trigger directly to the rear and it, it's been interesting because i've got the safety on because i've forgotten because i'm not used to this i'm starting to see not the flinch but what actually happens when i press those trigger and there's a few times where it doesn't go off and i'm just hauling the damn thing because i'm like go off I'm like mm. oh 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 well i've actually got some learning to do here as well because i shouldn't be like you know anyway yeah so. um we've been talking about the yeah the the bolt closing or safety off um down here as well and all my 22 matches have always been bolt open and safety on while moving and yeah come don't close the bolt and um, so what we've, oh, some of the matches here, what we've talked about is rifle shouldered before bolt closed. So you're, you're not going to shoulder the rifle with it, not in the reasonably close vicinity of the target. So as yeah. long as you're, as long as you're, you're shouldered and head on the gun, um, then you're fine to close the bolt. You don't necessarily have to have your eye through the scope on the target. Mm. Uh, and it's given you a little bit, a little bit of leeway. Um, mm. our, our, well, with the, the GPR re rules um, that we're using, also that's you you have to be looking through the scope and have the target. Your essentially your cone of fire has to be around the target rather than. With the idea being, if you do some stupid reason set the gun off, it's not going to go over. It's a within the cone of yeah. Uh, yeah, ear, um, ear loading, I think, is the term they use states. Yeah, and, but, but we've always, but the trouble is, we've always done it until recently. Um, yeah. You know, bang, like if you're going to move, we keep it, but, um, and then sh without, but again, you know. And we haven't had incidences. It's not a result of people sending stuff off into the air, but you're just refining and making better and making better and making better and making better. And that's yeah. the, it's the goal is it's if we cannot, if we can make something even safer without getting to the point, you know, of, chamber flag in between each movement or something like that because it gets to the point of ridiculousness but if we can do these little changes or little behavioral changes to make things safer which is best a good idea hey if it's we really were in front of any issues yeah 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 